Hello, my name's Dan. At the time of this filming, it's now early March 2015. Last May of 2014 and June of 2014, I drove from my home in Phoenix, Arizona up the Alcan Highway, or the Alaska Highway, as it's known now, Alcan, Alaska Canadian Highway. I drove up that highway to Alaska, got to Anchorage, and I wanted to share some of the ways and some of the things that worked for me, and I prepared to do that trip, and some of the things that happened along the way. First, let me show you what I did, where I went. This of course is the lower 48 here, so some of the lower 48, but primarily Canada here. As you can see, th this is a low budget, so low there is no budget operation, and as a result, a very low tech production. I wish I could say I'm good enough to be an amateur, but I'm just some guy with a GoPro. And it's more important to me to get the information out, and I'm hoping it will be helpful to you. If you're planning on loading up your motorcycle and driving up to Alaska, or you're thinking about it, I think this stuff will be useful and helpful to you. So, first, what I did, here's Phoenix right here. I drove up I-17, the Flagstaff. Then Highway, I believe it's 89 North. This is the Grand Canyon right here. It skirts the Grand Canyon. You go through Page. Then you head west on it to Kanab, Orderville. Then you start heading north. You catch U.S. Highway 20, hop over the mountains there. And then it's Interstate 15 all the way to the Canadian border. And then once in Canada... You're doing the Canadian highways. This is Calgary right there. And here's Great Falls Selby. This is Calgary right here. And I continued up past Edmonton, headed roughly uh, northwest. And where the red, I'm hoping, I know there's a little glare to this. I'm hoping you can see it. Where the red turns to blue, this is Dawson Creek. This is the official start of the Alcan Highway. And then the Alcan comes up here, Fort Nelson, Watson Lake, Whitehorse, cross back over to the U.S., to Alaska. It, the official end of it is Delta Junction. I didn't go that far. I actually went to Toke. And back here... Again, Watson Lake, White Horse, here's Toke right there. You come on down and Anchorage is right there. Once I got into Anchorage, I ditched my Victory Vision, that's what I was driving. Hopped on a rented Kawasaki KLR, joined a motorcycle touring group. Headed up the Parks Highway, the Fairbanks. And then from there, short trips on the Steese and then the Elliott Highway to the Dalton, and then on up to Dead Horse, Alaska on Prudhoe Bay. That's the start of the Alaska Pipeline right there. Came back down at Fairbanks, caught the Richardson, dropped back down the other side of the Alaska Range, which is a range of mountains that pretty much separates uh, Anchorage and Fairbanks. Cross that down, and then it's the Denali, going back to the Parks Highway and then back down. Once got back down to Anchorage, say goodbye to the MotorQuest folks. I hopped back on my Victory Vision. My fiance, fiance had flown in to Anchorage. She joined me on the bike. We toured the Kenai Peninsula there, four or five days or so. Back to Anchorage. She flew back home here to Phoenix, Arizona. And I caught the ferry out of Whittier, Alaska, and that's the dots here of the ferry. And you can see the dots coming back down on the inside passage here to Bellingham. And from there, then it was Interstate 5, to, I believe this is Interstate 90. You catch 15 and you drop back down into Phoenix. So that was the trip that I made. This was last May, June. 
It was phenomenal beyond my wildest hopes and expectations. It, it, truly an amazing trip. Let me back up a bit here and talk a little bit about my motorcycling experience. Back in, I w in 1965, I'm 10 years old, my mom had a little Honda 50. The engine block you could cradle in the palm of your hand here. A at that point, I was hooked on motorcycles. In high school, I had a Honda CB175. Back in the early 1970s, which is when I was in high school, uh, uh, motor vehicle code was your vehicle had to have 15 horsepower to be legal on the interstates there. Well, this Honda 175, it was a four stroke two banger. It must have had 16 horsepower, barely enough to qualify legally. But oh man, it was a light bike, and did I get blown around on there? During the military station in Germany, I had a Kawasaki Mach 3. That was a two-stroke, three-banger street bike. And in Germany, unless it was snowing, I was riding in the winter there, too. And then finally, late 1970s, May 1979, I had a Suzuki GS750, four-banger, four-stroke street bike. And I actually was living in Orange County at the time and caught Interstate 10 all the way to Jacksonville. Then I jogged up to Ohio and then came back this way, saw Mount Rushmore. And let's see here. Hmm. Drop back down. Whoops, that's Mount Rushmore. I didn't drop down there. I kept going to Yellowstone here, and then I drop back down, I believe that's Interstate 80 here, and from there drop back to Orange County. So I'm no stranger to driving, to touring on a motorcycle across country. In fact, I've driven to and in all 49 states in the Union, and if they ever develop a motorcycle that's amphibious and can get me to Honolulu, I'd consider it. From that, to share with you a little bit of my philosophy of driving. That, of course, I have destinations I'm shooting for, but they're not hard and fast. They're just a goal for the day. Two things are what get me to stop for the day. One is I'm just tired. It doesn't mean if I, even if I have hours of daylight left, if I'm tired, break. Or if I'm burning daylight, there are exceptions, but I don't like driving at night. The obvious reason is it ups the danger of driving at night. And for me, though, the primary reason is I drive across country to, what else, see the country, and you can't see it at night. You can't see past your headlights. So those, those are the reasons that I stop. And I'm looking, I... I typically don't have motel reservations, so I'm looking for the cheapest motel I can find wherever I happen to be. Motel 6's is about as fancy as I get. All I need is a door that locks, clean sheets, soft pillow, shower with hot water, and cable TV. And I'm a happy camper. I'm just spending the night there. I usually get on the road early in the morning. And so my needs are pretty simple doing the crossroads. A little bit more specific about Alaska. And oh, by the way, these are my notes. They, they help me keep on track and not forget things I want to share with you. The drive to drive up the Alcan, again, today called the Alaska Highway, hit me back in the late 1970s. A bug hit me. I did a little research back then. None of the highway was paved. And I just couldn't see myself fixing flats by the side of the road in the middle of the tundra. So the bug went dormant. And then in Christmas, Christmas of 2013, Santa, if I could get it here, Santa gave me this book, The Adventurous Motorcycle Guide to Alaska. I was hooked on over, all over again. That bug stopped being dormant. I woke up 
I'm telling my fiance, I have to go to Alaska. This has tons of great information in it. If you're even thinking of going, get this book. So I, I gobbled up every word in this book, talked it over my fiance. We decided, okay, this is doable. So as part of my research and planning for the trip, the book everybody needs to get, The Mile Post. It describes the highway mile post to mile post, from mile post 28 to mile post 30. This is what's going to be there, and that kind of stuff. Obviously, this is a big book, and so there's no room on the motorcycle when you have all of other kinds of stuff there. But you read it. I took notes. I had script seats. That's what I carried with me. In fact, none of my books did I carry with me. So this is the Bible of the Alcan Highway and getting up there. As part of this, back to the Canadian map here, the milepost has the west access, access to Dawson Creek. Out of Seattle, you can go either way here, but it basically gets to Dawson Creek. They have the central access route from Ellensburg and then to Dawson Creek. From Phoenix, of course, I did the east access route from Great Falls and then up to Dawson Creek. So you can choose what, whichever one you want. Of course, if you live in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic states, New England, England states, you can enter Canada where, wherever you want to, whatever works for you. But this is what the book covers here. So that's that. Two other books to share with you. First one, Alaska by Motorcycle. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Really easy read. The guy goes up there on a Suzuki. I know it's in here somewhere. Let's see. Well. A Suzuki DR650. That's how he goes up there. He did a little research, only a couple weeks, then he loaded up the bike and went and just kind of figured it out as he went along. I was really wanting to read somebody's story that went up in a touring class motorcycle because my victory vision is that. And so seeing Alaska from the back of a motorcycle, this couple actually went up there riding two up on their Honda Goldwing. And their adventures were really interesting for me because I also have a touring class motorcycle. And then there's any number of internet stories. There's all kinds of YouTube videos on, you can see. But these are some of the things that I used. And also after reading the book, that uh, you, there's no way to contact the author directly. So. You send a letter to the publisher, and if they don't think you're a wacko, they pass it on to the authors. And every author, every book I did that with, every publisher I did that with, I got a response from the authors, and then I was able to ask more questions to them. And I had a lot of questions. Also, I contacted the victory dealers in Alberta and Anchorage, and I asked them lots of questions, too. Let's see. So the plan was I was leaving May 20th. I gave myself 10 days to get to Anchorage with a three day grace period in case something happened. I had to, had to get be in Anchorage by June 1st because that's when the Moto Quest tour was leaving and I didn't want to miss that. I made that without a problem and for me Excuse me there. For me, I'm. There are exceptions, but for the most part, I know what I don't know, and I knew. I knew if I tried to drive to Dead Horse, Alaska, on the Arctic Ocean by myself, I was probably going to die. There is a story on the internet about a gentleman who who rode actually from Key West, Florida, 
the dead horse of Lhasa on his victory. He did it on an eight ball. But that just wasn't me. And so I left, put my victory away, joined the group, hopped on a Kawasaki KLR and drove on up there. Also, each progressive day up there, the planned um, trip and mileage was less and less and less. For about the first two days, three days of getting up there, I just wanted to get miles behind me. I went from Phoenix to Malad, M-A-L-A-D, Malad City, Idaho, in one day. That was about 755 miles. That's a long day for me. So in each day's leg was progressive, progressively shorter and shorter. When, when I hit the Alcan, my longest day from Whitehorse, Yukon Territory to Toke, Alaska, 395 miles. A little shorter, 400 miles. My shortest day was from Watson Lake to Whitehorse, which is 275 miles. On average, each day's days was 319 miles. Now, when I'm traveling lower 48, an average day for me is like 600 miles. A short day is something under 500. A long day is somewhere around 800. So I really shortened it up. Uh, I didn't want to be in a hurry. Murphy's Law, things happen. And so I had short days when I hit, hit the Alcan. Also, as I said earlier, I never make or seldom make motel reservations. But from all of my research, it said make your reservations early. The reason for that is the tourist season is short, so short three months, uh, four months outside, that things fill up and they book really quickly. So I had all my motel reservations done by January or so. And once I got to Dawson Creek, then every city I went to, I already knew where I was staying. All right, Alaska itself, there's some things you need to decide. The first thing, and well, here's just, I don't know what to call it. Something for your consideration, because Alaska truly is a whole different ball game, a completely different world than driving the lower 48s. You need to remember that. So when you're preparing and you're buying like your riding clothes and stuff for the motorcycle, if you can afford the top of the line, high quality, high end stuff, gear, parts, that kind of thing, get it. You don't want to skimp in Alaska. Now, I understand when funds are limited, I understand sometimes we don't, we can't afford the very top of the line. So, if you can't afford the top of the line, get what you can, can afford. Never make the mistake of, well, I can afford this, but I'm going to get something a little less because I want to save a few bucks. Big mistake. You can't believe the wilderness and, and the road can get really rough sometimes up there. Even though today the Alcan is all paved, except for exceptions here and there, and I'll get into that. But uh, don't skimp and get, don't skimp in getting what you're getting. If you can afford top of the line, get that. Or get what you can afford. Because, uh, yeah, it's different up there. One of the first things you're going to need to decide is what kind of bike to go on. I only have one bike, a Victory Vision, so that's my bike. But basically there's two categories, a street bike or an enduro, uh, a dirt bike modified to go also on the streets, sometimes called a dual sport bike. And a lot of times these bikes are outfitted for adventure riding. So th those are the two general categories and there's three areas you need to consider comfort. There are places where the Alcan is not paid, but for the most part it is paid. So street bikes are a whole lot more comfortable than enduros. The other area is road condition. You know street bikes are great when it's paved, but uh, when a construction site, pavement break, you're going to really wish you were on a dirt bike. I know I did. And then the fourth 
area is weather. It can snow up there in the middle of summer. The temperatures can drop below freezing and you're at sea level. If you're on a street bike, on paved road, you just got to stop or you're going to go down on the ice. On an enduro, a motorcycle outfitted for adventure riding, it dry, the temperature drops below freezing, you can just keep going. So those are the trade-offs. Just FYI, if I were to move to Alaska, I'd either get a second bike or I'd sell my Victory and get a bike outfitted for adventure riding on dirt roads. If all you have is a street bike in Alaska, it really limits where you can go there. Anchorage in the suburb, Fairbanks and its suburbs, the roads between the two cities. But uh, other than that, there isn't much other place you can go there. You can't drive the really famous roads, the Dalton, Denali, Dempster, or the Klondike Highways. You can't do those on street bikes unless you're really crazy. I never would. Your clothes. I love my leather jacket. This is my leather jacket. This is what I wear around town. I really wanted to wear it up to Alaska. I mean, a, a riding leather jacket was a thick leather. It's thicker than suede or pant leather you would wear when you go dining at night. Nothing, nothing protects your skins better than a than leather jacket, leather shaps, leather pants, should you go down. But it's just not practical up there. Again, in the metropolitan areas, you do see people wearing leather jackets, but not in the back roads. They're just not practical. There are many makes and brands of riding suits. This is an Olympia Ranger 3. This is what I got. I have over pants here. The leather material, you know, high tech materials are just awesome these days. At the material, it breathes and it's still waterproof. Comes with a liner. I got mine a size or two too big, so I could layer up underneath it. And thank goodness, because there was a couple times I had to do that. So if you're going to do some serious back road riding, a high-end quality, or again, whatever you can, as much as you can afford, that's what you need. There's a couple more things. I only needed them once. Hot hand hand warmers. I cannot find a pair of gloves. When the temperature drops below 30, can't find a pair of gloves that will keep my hands and fingers warm. Yeah, you can get electric gloves, you can even get electric heated vests to wear underneath. But I'm so old school, I'm always thinking, what if the battery goes dead? What if there's a short? Then what do you do? These guys are a little packet, air activated. What I did is I stuck them in the palm of my hands and uh, made it a little awkward, but it saved my fingers. Just saved my fingers. Yeah. All right. Hypocrite alert here. Don't travel alone like I did. Now, every day, I was calling my fiance to let her know that I had made it to my next des destination safely. And, <laughs> funny story, I'm crossing the international bo border between the lower 48 and into Canada. And, of course, um, the border guard, and they're all very nice. They're very business, as a matter of fact, but they're all very nice. You know, he looks at me, he looks behind me, and kind of surprised, he goes, Are you alone? Yeah, just me. So, I don't suggest it, even though I did it. And so, because of that, one of the things I did was, I rented a satellite phone. That does a couple things. If I break down wherever I am, I can call for help. And literally, it's hundreds of miles between cell phone reception, forget any civilization, just the signal. You get out there and hundreds of miles. So wherever I was, I could make a phone call. And then the other thing that did is my cell phone 
I have free roaming with the package I have. Not in Canada. I'm glad I found this out because I called my provider. And you may want to check with your cell phone. You may still get the roaming, but they charge and they charge a lot for it. So it was cheaper for me when I was in Canada to make my phone calls with the satellite phone than to pay for roaming with my cell phone. Now, of course, if I go down, I break a leg, I'm unconscious, it doesn't help me. But short of that kind of thing, I, can call, I could call for help wherever I was. This next area, I consider myself to be unusually knowledgeable about this, mainly because I asked so many people about it and they said they didn't know. And that is, when I travel, I don't like traveling without a firearm. I always travel with a firearm. I have a concealed weapons permit in Arizona. Many states have reciprocity, so I'm good to go. You know, I don't flash, I don't threaten. I don't want people to even know I have it. I just want to have it. States where I don't have reciprocity in, you know, an, an un unload a firearm goes on one lock saddlebag the bullets go in the other lock saddlebags and that's just it if i need it hopefully i got time to put the two together but i have it so i was researching how do you transport a firearm through canada and i called uh up the mounties there i called them several times there the mounties the firearm division or department and I shouldn't uh, listen to the lady. When she first told me, the first time I called there, just ship it to where you're going. But now I had to find out for myself. They're pretty strict. And as far as long guns go, you know, anything like a Sega 12 or AR-15, AK-47, you can forget those. The only thing they'll allow there and shotguns over under side by side or in rifles bolt action scope mounted single shot rifle mainly this stuff is for hunting and so those are allowed now what am i going to do like the old cowboy days cowboy days have that in a leather pouch on the side of my motorcycle like you see in the cowboys or horses That'll attract so much attention, I'd probably get pulled over in every city I went through. So, I, uh, so I asked them about handguns. This is what I like to carry. Sig Sauer Ultra Compact 45 ACP Single Stack 1911 System. This is my preferred concealed weapon piece. They wouldn't allow that there. So, then I thought, okay, how about my Ruger SP-101? This is a little five-shot wheel gun. Nope, they wouldn't allow this either. So then finally, I thought, okay, my Bond Arms Derringer Snake Slayer 4. I mean, how could anybody, if I can open this up, not approve something like this? It's only two shots. It takes 410 shotgun shells or 45 long coats. That's it. At first they said, oh yeah, this is fine. And then they asked me, well, where are you entering Canada? And I said, Alberta. Oh, if you were entering in British Columbia, it'd be okay, but Alberta, it's not. They wouldn't even allow that. So then I had to go to Plan B, shipping a firearm out there. A number of times I call people up. This isn't a sale. I'm shipping a firearm from me to me, and I'm shipping it from a U.S. city, Phoenix, to a U.S. city, Anchorage. And it's going to be there waiting when I get that, oh, you can't do that, international shipping, I remind them. Oh, it's not international shipping. When I went to UPS, they said, yes, we do that. So unloaded, all of that, box up. 
my pencil go to UPS? Lady goes, oh, we don't ship those. I'm getting a little irritated by now. Well, I was told you do. Well, we don't. And the lady alluded to, hinted that I wasn't told that in the first place. Well, yeah, I was. So I was pretty pissed off, but I left. So I called FedEx. Same thing. Oh, that's international shipping. No, it's not. Oh, it's illegal. No, it's not. Oh, I forgot to mention, before I started calling the shipping area, a, a shipping company, I called the local ATF. And they said, yes, as long as it's not a, a sale, not a straw per, person purchase, you're shipping it from me to me, that's legal. So I made sure it was legal. I call up FedEx. Lady goes, oh, we don't ship fire. Okay, I understand that. I'm a big free market uh, advocate. You know, as long as it's within the realm of the law, businesses can decide what they'll do and not do. And FedEx doesn't ship fire. But then she says, what you do is break the pistol apart. When I was in the infantry, it's called field stripping it. You have your slide group here, your pistol group here. And she said, ship them in two different boxes. Now it's not a firearm, legally. No longer meets the legal definition of firearm. Now it's firearm parts and yes we do that I went great so I broke it apart put it in two boxes FedEx shipped them up there God bless FedEx and in Alaska I have reciprocity there so I was able to travel around with my firearm and uh, although I felt a little naked going through Canada without it okay the actual ride itself couple things that, that you're going to experience here. First one, uh, there's two bridges. They're, they have grading, kind of the expanded metal. It's the kind of bridge where when you go over, you look straight down, you can see whatever you're going over, whether it's water or gorge, whatever. There's one just out of side of Dawson Creek. Just as you're entering, let me see here, Taylor, British Columbia. And then there's a second longer one. Uh, right, hmm, right about here. It says, uh, it's just south of Teslin, T-E-S-L-I-N, Yukon Territory. You're crossing Teslin Lake. And the second one actually goes like this. On a street bike anyway, you know, when you're going down the highway, you're tracking a line, it's a straight line. On these bridges, there are uh, shimmies, there are wobbles. Yeah, on the street, that happens to you on the highway, you need to take your bike to the shop that the front end looked at. But on these uh, graded bridges, that it just does that naturally. You don't want to fight it. Yeah, if you're not used to it, it's spooky as I'll get out. And they're like, wow, what's happening to my bike? It's just the treads finding their line through the grading. And also, going up the Alcan, there are two areas where I, I had a little bit of concern. The first one was, I had just passed Haynes Junction. Let me see where it is. Right here is Haynes Junction. I was roughly here. There's some mountains. On the left, I think around Mount Carney's, Mount Arch Archibald, Mount Martha Black. And the clouds were coming in and, and being blown against these mountains and being stopped there. The road was at, eventually was at the base of the mountains. Gloomy started the rain, rain. My Victory has an air temperature gauge. And it was dropping. 41, 40, 39, 38, 37. I'm like, if we hit freezing, I'm in big trouble here. I gave brief consideration to turning around and going back, but decided to keep going. Fortunately, it never got colder than 37, and then the road started to depart the mountains, and the sun came out, and it warmed up. The very first next place I stopped, which it wasn't that much further down the highway, I'm talking to the gas station clerk. I go, oh, you know, I was on this highway, and the temperature drops, and uh, he gave me this look that said, and you were expecting what? And then, but he said, yeah, that can happen here this time of year. It's like, oh, jeebus, give me your fright. 
Because again, on a street bike, highway freezes, you got to stop or you're crashing. You know, dirt bike, not so much. And then the next thing that happened was how much far down there? About another 180 miles. This was around Beaver Creek, British Columbia, which is roughly right there, right before you cross back over into the U.S. and Alaska. There was construction about 10 miles before the city, and you go in the city about 10 miles, about 20 miles on the other side of the city as you head towards Alaska there. Now, admittedly, most of that, the road was dirt, no longer paved, but it was hard packed gravel and dirt. Can't, not like a paved road, but not that bad e either. But for about three or four miles, the road turned into thick gravel and then it turned into thick mud. Again, if you're on an enduro, that's actually fun. When the wheel, when your rear wheel wants to pass up the front wheel on a dirt bike, that's called fun. On a touring class bike, that's called, oh my God. I was slow and cautious. There was a couple times I was convinced I was going down. Fortunately, I didn't. You just slow and cautiously. You have no other alternative except turn around if you want to go back home. But there's no side route. There's no way around that at all. If you want to go where you're going, you just got to keep going. Scary as all get out for me. I made it. But frightening. Ah, animals, they're all over the place. Buffalo, bison by the side of the road. I saw a lot of black bears side of the road, off the side of the road, just off the road. At one point, there was a little rise by the side of the road. I saw a black bear coming down with two cubs. It was so cool. Moose, elk, uh, what else is there? All kinds of all kinds of wildlife. You know, if the stereotypical, you come around a hairpin turn and there's an animal right there by the road, you know, don't honk, don't speed up, don't slow down, just keep going. Try not to spook them. It's not it, often easy. I did that on one turn. It was a deer and it flinched. And I thought, don't you run out in front of me. Don't you do it. And then it bolted the other way. But it was like, oh. You know, and please, don't try to take a selfie with any of these animals. Even the ones that are vegetarians, you can't believe how big a moose is. Until you've seen it in nature, things are huge. Yeah, they'll hurt you pretty bad if they want to. So just keep going. If you see it in time and in the road, then stop and wait for them to get off the road. But if around the turn, best you can, just keep going. Let's see. I'm thinking for this segment, I'm done. The next segment, I'm actually going to go out there to my motorcycle. And I showed you some of the things I did to prepare it and those types of things. I'll show you the tools, the spare parts, the survival gear I carried with me and those kinds of things. I hope this information has been helpful to you if you're thinking of going up there. And please realize everything I just told you that was last summer, last late spring, summer. By this late spring, summer 2015, it could be completely different. Who knows? Uh, and so keep that in mind. And uh, drive safe out there. And the next time I see you, we'll be at my bike to show you that stuff. See you then. Hello again, and we're back. As you can see, we're back outside. This is my Victory Vision here. The one and only bike that uh, got me up to Anchorage and back, uh, and safely at that. Before I came out here, I reviewed the previous section, and so there's a couple things I left out, and a couple things I want to explain a little bit more. Uh, up in Alaska, the, the highways up there, they do have numbers, but up there, there's so few of them, I guess, 
that they're referred to by name, the Dalton, the, the Nelly, the Parks, and those kinds of things. So when you're up there, and you, if you ask somebody, hey, how do I get on Highway 4, they may look at you blankly. You say, hey, how do I get connect with the Dalton? They go, oh yeah. It's, that's what people recognize up there. So the highways have names. My understanding is that's the way it used to be in the lower 48, but then we got so many interstates and so many state highways, it, it just became impossible to do. So they gave them numbers. But up in Alaska, the highways are known by names. Earlier, when I was referring to the horsepower that needed, needed uh, by law, um, by the Motor Vehicle Department, to go on the interstates, I believe I said it was 15 horsepower. What I didn't say clearly was that was in California when I lived there in the 70s. Actually, I grew up in California, but when I was driving. So my little uh, Honda CB175 had like 16 horsepower barely enough to, to get me where I was going on the freeway. <coughs> oh boy, excuse me. Uh, also, a little bit more about uh, street bikes. Just about all kinds of bikes, street or dirt or enduro, ha have gone to Alaska. And at the same time, I would discourage anybody from riding a sports bike up there. It's just not the kind of driving, not the kind of roads where you want to be burning them up. You can come around a turn and it could be a pavement break. All of a sudden the road's not paved anymore. Or worse yet, there could be a buffalo standing right in the middle of the road. And, you know, those things aside, you don't go up there to do it quickly. You go up there for the enjoyment of the ride. The scenery is gorgeous. Mountains, valleys. That's why you do it. So I would discourage anybody from riding a sports bike up there. My average speed, if you're doing 45 or 50, that's pretty fast on the Alcan. Usually 30 to 40 as you putz down the highway. When signs say slow to a certain speed, rest assured there's a reason for that and slow to that speed. Whatever the reason is, you're coming up on it. You don't want to be going fast. Also, a little bit more about firearms and taking them into Canada. I was informed by sources and individuals that I know and I trust and I have confidence in that what they're telling me is valid and accurate. And they said that the Canadian border guards up there at the checkpoint. They love catching Americans trying to get into their country and not claim a firearm. So whatever you do, even if you space it and you just remembered you have a firearm, don't lie to them. At a minimum, you'll never see that firearm again after they catch you. You could not see your freedom for a little while also. So. When you go there and you ha have a legal firearm, side-by-side -side shotgun, you know, bolt action rifle, there is paperwork you've got to fill out. You can get it online. You need best to have it filled out before you get there. And then they're going to have you go park in their parking place. Obviously, I didn't have to do this because I didn't have a firearm. They have you park and then you bring the firearm to their offices and they inspect it, they log it, they look at serial numbers. I'm sure they, they run it to see if it's been stolen. And uh, so if you have a firearm, even when you're doing it legally, it's going to delay your crossing. And don't lie. Just don't do it. It's not good. Let's see. Oh, a little bit more about animals. Again, I don't think I was real clear here. If you see an animal up the road, stop and wait for him to get off the road. You know, if you have 100 meters, 200 meters, or meters, it's a safe distance. It's a bear, it's a buffalo, it's a moose, or an elk. Just wait for him to get off the road. If you come around a turn, and if you stop right there, you're way too close to him, 
then gradually slow down. Don't honk. Don't rev the engine. Don't do anything sudden. And just keep going. God willing, they won't bolt out in front of you. I think I told you the story of the deer that I thought was going to do it. Thank goodness it bolted the other way. And anything else here? One last thing I didn't cover real well before. The difference between leather jackets and riding suits. Again, leather jackets, that thick leather, nothing protects your skin more if you go down and you're sliding across the highway to protect you from road rash than leather. And at the same time, up there, a riding suit is what's indicated. You know, leather in a sprinkle, in a mild rain that's short, it'll keep you dry. But anything longer than that, you're going to get wet. A riding suit, you can wear it if it's raining or not. These high-tech materials and fabrics they have today. They breathe, so you don't overheat in them if it's not raining. If it's raining, they keep you waterproof. And although not as good as leather, they do have armoring in them, what they call armoring in them, at critical places. Now, I hear armoring, and I think, you know, army tanks or Bradley fighting vehicles. It's not that kind of armoring. It's just some extra reinforcement, some extra stuff in the riding pants, the riding jacket to give you protection in the knees, the elbows, the back, it's there. So there is a little bit more. But up there the weather changes on a dime and you can just keep going if you're in a riding suit. Okay, a little bit, a little bit about the roads up they have this thing, this type of road material, road service called chip steel. I was like, what the heck is chip steel? Researched it on the internet, pulled up videos on it, and I still didn't get it. Okay, I've been to Alaska and back. Let me tell you what I think of chip steel. If, no, they, chip steel is, they have like crushed rock, and then they have a layer of tar over it. And it takes a week or two for it to set up, for it to cure. After that, the road surface is not bad. You know, it worked just fine on my bike. It wasn't a problem at all. The problem happens when chip seal deteriorates. It turns into something that looks like thick gravel. I'm not joking here. That's what it looks like. And if it rains, and on some of the highways, Alaska, they spray the slurry on there, then it's thick mud. Road's supposed to be chip steel and a good surface, but it deteriorates. And the winters there are so severe that the roads deteriorate rather quickly. And the, the growing season for trees, the tourist season for tourists, what else? Or the repair season up there for roads is really short. And so they're out there in the summer months fixing these roads and resurfacing. But where it deteriorates, it's just like gravel. A couple things can happen. You folks in the upper Midwest, uh, mid-Atlantic states, New England states, you're gonna recognize them. Frost heaves. Originally, I'm from Southern California. Now I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I didn't have a clue what a frost heave was. Basically, as I'm understanding it, water gets under the road surface. It pools there. The size of a baseball, the pool size of a basketball, or bigger. And the physics of water, the little molecules in there, the H and the hydrogen, and the two parts oxygen, the H2O, as water cools, it contracts. Right at the moment it freezes, it expands. During the cold months, what the upshot of this is, is it creates mounds in the road. First time I ran over them, I didn't know what it was until I figured, oh, Frosty, that's what this is. I was pulling into Grand Prairie. Grand Prairie, Alberta, I believe. Nope, Grand Prairie, yeah, Grand Prairie, Alberta. 
and it, it reminded me of snow skiing on moguls. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You don't want to do anything like be going fast and hit those guys. It will absolutely mess up your suspension. I was lucky. I was already going slow, so it was okay. So you have the winter months, you have the frost heats, they freeze, summer comes, the thaw hits, and the ice melts, and now these lumps, now they're potholes. So then you have potholes all over. Again, you don't want to be going fast when you hit those. At the frost heats, they also have what's called pavement breaks. You're going down the highway, highway surface is fine. Paved, good quality chip seal, and all of a sudden, it just ends. Now they have signs giving you a heads up, and when they say slow down, slow down. You don't want to go off the pavement and onto the dirt. Sometimes, as I said earlier, it's just like thick gravel. Slow down, go slow, go cautiously. Construction zones. Like I said, the repair season is really short up there, like most everything else is. And uh, they have these byways around it, turn the dirt, turn the gravel. And uh, I think I already told the story, it scared me to death, the longest one I went through. Fortunately, after oh, Beaver Creek, that's the town, after I got past there, there was a few other places with construction, but it wasn't nearly as bad. Those couple of miles and the thick gravel and the thick, thick mud just scared me to death. So that's enough of backing up here. Let me go through a couple things, a couple more things. There's this thing, again, you probably already know, it's called sparkling. My understanding is that word is a combination of the word function and sparkle. You can get on the internet, you can get on, pull up YouTube, YouTube videos, and you've got motorcycles and the high-tech electronics they have there are, are impressive. Global positioning, Wi-Fi speakers in the helmets with little metallic voice going, turn left at next exit, that kind of stuff. I just didn't get that kind of stuff. But let me so, show, again, like this video, I'm very low tech. <laughs> so, let me show you the few things that I have in the way of sparkling. I'm going to jostle you here a little bit. I hope you don't get car sick. Here's my bike. Of course, handlebars, dashboard. I just added an altimeter and then I added a compass. It's not too bad. It's not too bad on lower 48 interstates but you get on state highways in rural areas rocky mountain states montana wyoming new mexico uh, what else in colorado and they just don't mark them real well so i need to know and sometimes if it's cloudy and i don't know where the sun is i'm not quite sure what direction i'm going or if i've turned the right way so i have a cheapo compass here and I cheapo altimeter. Mainly I want to know, am I ascending or descending? Am I climbing or am I uh, going downhill? Uphill or downhill? Climbing or descending? So these are the things I have. The Victory Vision already has heated grips and heated seat. They're real nice when the weather cools. For the front here, I have this stuff, uh, Lamin X, L-A-M-I-N dash X. And I put some on here, I put some on the lights just to protect it from flying rocks. You get behind a truck up there, especially on the Dalton, I didn't ride this bike on the Dalton, but if you're behind a big truck, they throw huge rocks at speed you cannot believe. So I just got these to help protect my light and those kinds of things. Then, this is, let's see here, so you can see it. This is specific for Victory Vision. This is the Victory Ultimate Touring Bag. 
it was just me riding solo so it just sits where the passenger is I've ridden in some pretty heavy rains for several hours and it's waterproof everything in there was dry and uh, plus something to lean against as I bounce down the highway in addition to all that like my tools spare parts those kinds of things I don't need to take those in every time I get a motel room they stay locked in my battle saddlebags or my trunk but clothes toothbrush those kinds of things this hooks here you just unhook it you pick it up and it's like a suitcase and that's all I need to take into the motel room with me it works really well lastly I had this rack put on again it's a victory rack specifically for my trip to Alaska because I didn't know where I was going to put a gas can and when you're up there again unless it's close to Anchorage or close to Fairbanks you won't see a motorcycle that's going down the highway without a gas can strapped somewhere on that. I strapped it here I used the bungee netting to hold it on there I got to tell you, this is the worst place for a gas can because gas is kind of heavy. It really rows my center of gravity and at slower speeds, the dynamic and handling characteristics of the bike really shifted. But I couldn't figure out another place to put it, so it was right here, gas can. And oh, rule of thumb is if your bike has a fuel gauge, fill up at half a tank. If it doesn't, like the Kawasaki's and Duro's uh, fill up every hundred miles. Two reasons for that. One is it's a distance between gas stations and even if you know where the next one is and you know you can make it there sometimes they're not open and then you're you're stuck so fill up at half a tank or a hundred miles depending if you have a gas gauge or not. So that's about it on the Farkling. Put your back here. There's that. Talk a little bit about tires. Well, there we go. Just to make sure it's right here. Talk a little bit about tires. When I bought this bike new, it came standard with the Dunlop Elite 3s on there. That's the only tire I've ever used. I find it to be a very high grade quality tire. Lower 48 riding. I get uh, 13 to 15,000 miles on a set before I trip, have to, uh, before I need new tires. For Alaska, even though I had about a thousand miles left on my old tires, I went ahead and put new tires on there. I'm just thinking safety here and not wanting to be on the side of the road with a flat tire. Also, this stuff is called Ride-On. It goes inside the tire. It self-balances the tire. I don't even know it's in the tire when I'm driving. There's no front end shib shimmy or wobble shaking. There's nothing like that going on. I don't notice any problems in the rear tire. Once when I was getting wire, uh, wires, once when I was getting tires changed, the service tech came out, rolled my wheel out there with the old tire still on it, and showed me a screw embedded into the tread. I didn't even know it was there. I had no flat tire. I'm fairly religious about checking tire pressure and no loss of PSI. This stuff works. I needed every advantage possible so I wouldn't end up on the side of the road. And that was, so this stuff is great. I also realized there was no way if I got a flat tire, even if I could find a way to get the wheel off the ground. See, this bike doesn't have a center stand, it just has a kickstand. I wasn't going to be able to get the wheel off and change it, so I wanted everything possible to prevent that from happening, and this stuff is great. In fact, uh, you know, knock on 
AstroTurf here. I have never had a flat tire. Also, there's nothing, not much to do with Alaska. I just run the uh, AMS oil in here, the thin, synthetic 2050 rate. This applies more to summer here in the Sonoran Desert, Phoenix, Arizona. The engine runs a little hot and it's, this oil handles it really well. Now, let's see. This is what I have spare parts in. And this is my survival stuff. You know, when the temperature was dropping on the stretch of road I mentioned earlier, say it had dropped, dropped the freezing. Say it had dropped below freezing, I had to stop. Then what? I'm out in the middle of the weather. Then what do I do? You know, you're starting to get kind of to survival mode there. So this is my survival stuff here. Let me put it out for you. I think you met the hot hand warmer. And while I'm doing this, um, my mindset is, you know, if anything major breaks, the engine, the transmission, the electric, I'm not going to be able to fix it. But if there's a bolt loose or something simple, then I need the tools to be able to fix it. So here's my survival stuff. Simple little shelter. Just, it unfolds like a blanket, fold it over me. Something to keep the weather off. This is a small little compact bivouac tent. Again, I could be inside this survival blanket and I have a survival candle I can light to generate heat flow. Again, we're talking survival mode here. If anything happens, Alaska, as you already know, it could snow at sea level there. You just never know this kind of stuff. And also a simple first aid kit. So these are my survival stuff. Again, the tools I brought. I'll move over here. It's stuff that I can replace. You know, again, something internal, there's no way I can do deal with that on the road. I'm just stuck. I'm on my satellite phone calling AAA saying, hey, I need a toy. I need a tow. Which reminds me, I upgraded my Auto Club membership, my AAA membership, to include uh, specialized towing for motorcycles and 100 miles of free towing should you need it. Now, up in Alaska, even with 100 miles free, you're still probably going to be t paying for towing. See, kind of forget what all this stuff is. Get this. This is in here are light bulbs for the lights. Extra air filter. Some tape. Fuses. You blow a fuse. All of a sudden, you you have no starter mortar. Extra fuses and extra spark plugs. This is just what I carried with me when I was up there. Fortunately, I didn't need any of that stuff. But traveling under familiar roads that'll make you feel real a lot more confident is a full tank of gas. And these things made me feel a whole lot better just knowing I had them. Should I get stuck? Should I blow a fuse? Should I need a new spark plug? And let's see here. I know I have a toolkit here somewhere. There we go. Simple little uh, roll up and roll out. Full kit, let me grab the camera again. This is what I have. I don't know why I have tire irons there. I don't think I'd ever change a tire, but I got them. 
and you know lightweight hammers flashlights combination wrenches needle nose crescents I have sockets here quarter inch sockets in case I need them so this is my traveling tool kit so this is the stuff I carried with me it's all individuals what makes you feel better So that's it. This is all I got for you. If you're thinking of driving up the Alcan to Alaska, go for it. Do it. You'll never regret it. It is just an awesome ride. And how many people have done that? I mean, a few, but not most haven't. Most people I talk to, oh, I've always wanted to do that, but I haven't. Go do it. You know, a lot of the planning is individual, what, what you think you might need and what makes you feel better. You know, should something happen, you, you got the widget to fix it with, so you can limp back to civilization. Oh, that reminds me of another thing. People on the Alcan are very friendly, and if you get stuck, they're more than willing to help you. Once I pulled off by the side of the road, there's, of course, no radio station, so I got had my MP3 player playing uh, 60s and 70s rock and roll. And I'd messed it up, so I couldn't fix it without pulling over. So I pulled over, and I'm fiddling with it. I hear this voice go, hey, are you okay? Need any help? And I look up, and there's this young gentleman in a pickup truck. Very nice, concerned about me. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad you stopped and asked. I'm just fine. But I really appreciate it. I mean, that's how folks are there. They will help you if you're stuck, if you're broke down by the side of the road. And, uh, you know, they're just really super that way. So, I'll leave you with this one last thought I do in all my videos. The, des <laughs> the, destination. the journey is the destination. It's the traveling that makes for the great stories. So enjoy your journey. If you're thinking about it, if you're planning on it, good luck. Watch out for the animals. Don't piss off law enforcement and you'll be okay. Until my next video, I mean, I wish you well. Drive safe and drive sanely.